Okay, um, great plug on the book. My chapter deals with, as you can see, the title, Joseph Smith's First Vision and the Book of Mormon, The Historical Approach. And I have to admit, if you're going to do the historical approach, you have to do a little bit of homework. You have to kind of get up to speed on what the history of Mormonism is all about and such. And I know there are a lot of historical uh, aspects that can be addressed. I deal with it all the time. But the reason why I felt it was important to address these two issues is because there have been some very significant statements made about the first vision and also made about the Book of Mormon. And I'm going to go into this. So I'm going to probably talk a little bit quickly here because I'm going to cram about an hour and a half presentation into 30 minutes, and that's going to be very hard. Anyway, first of all, we have this statement from Gordon B. Hinckley. He was the 16th president of the Mormon Church. This is a conference message that he gave back in October of 1961. He said, I would like to say that this cause is either true or false. Either this is the kingdom of God, or it is a sham and a delusion. Either Joseph talked with the father and the son, or he did not. If he did not, we are engaged in blasphemy. Amen. What do I have to do? No, 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 no. Don't touch that mic. Speak it through that mic so we can hear you. Oh, you want this mic too. Okay. Let me, let me move over here then. Okay. Let's go on. Maybe. Here we go. First of all, let's talk about James 1.5. Uh, Mormons will often bring up James 1.5 as we find uh, where Joseph Smith claims in his history in section 1 verse 11, while I was laboring under the extreme difficulties caused by the contest of these parties of religionists, and I'll explain what he's talking about later, I was one day reading the epistle of James, first chapter, fifth verse, which reads, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not or without reproach, and it shall be given him. Now, there's something that we need to understand when it comes to James 1.5. Joseph Smith misuses it, and this is what I mean by that. While James speaks specifically of wisdom, Joseph Smith uses this verse in connection with his search for knowledge. You see the difference here? Wisdom is the proper application of knowledge. So he is misusing James 1.5. If he's going to go to James 1.5 in the New Testament to get this knowledge, you would think if he's going to use wisdom, he's also going to use the rest of the Bible to test his conclusions, which of course he does not, which causes a lot of problems. Now we find that Joseph Smith, regarding his first vision, gave at least four different accounts this is the 1832 diary vision account. This is the first one. It's the one that's written in his own hand. We know that much. But there's some interesting details about his 1832 account that we need to keep in mind when we examine all the others as well. First of all, Smith claims to be in his 16th year of his age, or he would be 15. He knows from reading the scriptures, he said, that there is no society or denomination built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, he already knows that all the churches are false, and he learns this by reading the scripture, he says. He is concerned about the welfare of his soul, and he cries to the Lord for mercy. So that was the motivation for this encounter with one that he calls the Lord, who was crucified. Obviously, this must be Jesus because the Father was not crucified. So he's giving us enough details to find out what's actually going on, why he's motivated to go out and to pray and such. He says that the Lord that was crucified tells him that he is forgiven. There's no mention of any religious excitement or revival that motivated him to go out into the woods at this time. Now, in November 9th, 1835, he gives another account. In this one, he claims to be about 14 years old, not 15. He claims that when he went out into the woods to pray, he was startled by a noise behind him, like some person was walking toward him. He sprung up on his feet, but no one was there. That's what he says. An unidentified personage appeared in the midst of a pillar of flame. This is what he says in this account. Another personage later appears and said unto me, thy sins are forgiven thee. 
He testified unto me that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, the language here is interesting because that seems like a a strange way for Jesus to describe himself. Like in third person, Jimmy likes this, Jimmy likes that. You remember the Seinfeld episode? But it sounds like some other personage was talking about Jesus, as if it's not Jesus that's doing the talking. Again, there's no mention of any religious excitement or revival in this particular uh, vision account. Okay, whoop. Okay, let's go back to that. There's another 1835 account. This is November 14th. Joseph Smith gives Erastus Holmes a brief relation of my experience while in my juvenile years, say from six years up to the time I received my first visitation of angels, visitation of angels, which was when I was about 14 years old. Now, it's a very brief account. It doesn't go into a lot of detail, but the visitation of angels becomes significant. Again, in this account, he does not mention any religious excitement, no revival whatsoever that motivated him to go out into the woods. Then we come to the 1838 account. This is the, eight, this is the version that most Mormons are familiar with. And this is the version that I think is the real foundation of Mormonism because there are some details in here that clearly, clearly makes the statement that the Mormon church is true, or I should at least say that all the others are false. Smith, for the first time in this account, mentions a religious excitement in the spring of 1820. This involved the Baptist, the Methodist, and Presbyterian churches in the Palmyra area where he lived at the time. He is confused as to which church is true. In this account, he talks about the different argumentation that was going on between the various denominations that were involved. He claims he is motivated by James 1.5 to pray about the matter. He claims he is visited by two personages. One says to Smith, this is my beloved son, hear him. That makes it pretty clear who these two personages are that allegedly appear to Joseph Smith. Smith is told by one or both, we might assume, that by these personages that all the churches are wrong, their creeds are an abomination, and their professors are corrupt. He is warned not to join any of them in this vision. And this claim surprises him, for he says, for at this time it had never entered into my heart that all were wrong. Well, that's not what he said in 1832. What's fascinating about this claim is that this appears in, if you have a post-1981 edition of Joseph Smith's testimony, if you have a pre-1981 edition, that claim isn't found in it. They added that late. That's a relatively later edition into Joseph Smith's testimony. I don't know why they did that. They it probably would have been better had they not put it in there because it so shows that there is indeed a contradiction in Joseph Smith's testimony. All right, let's see. Whoop. Okay. All right, let me, let me talk about the revival a little bit. Okay, yeah, let me go to the revival. According to Joseph Smith, and this is in his history, this is uh, section one, verses five, six, and seven. He says, sometime in the second year after our removal to Manchester, this would be New York, there was in the place where we lived an unusual excitement on the subject of religion. Great multitudes united themselves to the different religious parties. I was at this time in my 15th year, or he was 14. The Presbyterians were most decided against the Baptists and Methodists and used all the powers of both reason and sophistry to prove their errors. So he's showing this conflict that was going on between the various denominations that were involved in this particular revival that he experienced. One thing Joseph Smith does in this account is he gives us enough details that we can pinpoint precisely what revival he is referring to. And the way he describes this revival, it is clear that he's describing a revival that took place not in 1820, but in 1824. That causes some significant problems for Joseph Smith's story. Let me just go through some of them here. First of all, 
No, re the religious excitement that Smith describes, as I said, did not take place in 1820. No multitudes were added to any of the churches that he mentions in this revival, okay? And he mentions the Baptist, Methodist, and Presbyterian churches. We know from the church records of these churches that they did not experience any huge amount of growth, at most maybe five, five, okay? Some lost, well, I think one of them lost five, another one gained five, I think they probably stole them from that one, I guess, maybe. And one, one didn't show any, any increase or decrease in membership at all. But clearly in 1820, there was no great multitudes added to these churches. This revival that Smith is describing, as I said, took place in 1824. Now you might say, well, is that really all that significant? Absolutely it's significant, and this is why. Changing the date, and this is why the Mormon church won't change the date. They keep using the, the bogus 1820 date. Because they know if they change the date, it messes up the chronology. And that really exposes a problem. If changing the date would disrupt Smith's chronology, for example, he claims he was persecuted for telling this story as an obscure boy only between 14 and 15 years of age. Instead, he would be a young man of around 18. In other words, not quite at that innocent age where you probably wouldn't expect uh, such, such a lie, okay? They're always trying to play off his innocence. Well, at 18, yeah, you, you're not so innocent at 18, I would say, okay? And this would become a problem. There would also be this problem. Smith claimed that the angel Moroni appeared to him in 1823. That's easily documented. Or three years after he learned that all the churches are wrong. If the revival really took place in 1824, Smith's encounter with Moroni would have really been his first vision. So that messes everything up. So this is why I think the Mormon church will not give the proper date. They're going to have to stick with this, this date of 1820 because I think they understand the significance. Now, Mormon apologists have often pointed to an 1820 Methodist camp meeting, um, but the details of the two events are not the same. I, I actually heard at a Sunstone symposium, D. Michael Quinn talk about this Methodist camp meeting, and I happened to be sitting behind Dan Vogel, who's written a number of books on Mormon history. And I remember when Quinn tried to use this argument of a Methodist camp meeting that somehow bolsters Smith claims, you know, of this revival going on. I remember Dan Vogel's head just going down and he just shook his head like this. And I was kind of chuckling because I agree with Dan. I thought Quinn was really out of line in that. And really for a historian of his caliber, that was very disappointing. But what else do they have? What else do they have? A Methodist camp meeting is a Methodist camp meeting. There's normally not a lot of Presbyterians and Baptists joining in in that event. So it can't be the same thing that Joseph Smith was talking about. Let me go a little higher. There we go. All right. Exodus 33:20. If we read in the King James Version, which Joseph Smith probably would have had at that time, it reads, and he said, thou canst not see my face for there shall no man see me and live, all right? What does Joseph Smith do with this? Now, he comes out with the Joseph Smith translation later on. He is commanded by God to do a new translation of the Bible. Why? Because as Mormons believe even to this day, the Bible has been corrupted. It was transmitted inaccurately down through the ages. Many plain and precious parts were taken out of it allegedly. And so it's not trustworthy. So God gives Joseph Smith a revelation to give us a new set of scriptures that would, you would think, solve the problem. Well, notice what he does to Exodus 33:20. He adds several words to this passage where it says, And he said unto Moses, Thou canst not see my face at this time, lest mine anger be kindled against thee also, and I destroy thee. I have no idea why God speaks in King James English, but anyway. Um, it says, And thy people, and for there shall no man among them see me at this time and live, for they are exceeding sinful. 
And no sinful man hath at any time, neither shall there be any sinful man at any time that shall see my face and live. But wait a minute. That's exactly what Joseph Smith claims happened to him. He saw God the Father. He saw Jesus the Son. So you can ask the question, well, why is there this apparent contradiction? You have to remember the Joseph Smith translation, according to Joseph Smith himself, in volume one, page 368 of the documentary History of the Church, Joseph Smith himself says he finished his translation of the Bible in July of 1833. Now, if this was a story that Smith was always telling, it would really make no sense to change Exodus 33:20 and make it very clear that no sinful man at any time will ever see the face of God and live. Why does he put that in there? I think it's clear. He wasn't telling the story. This is a later invention, even after 1833. Remember, his 1832 diary account never mentions God the Father. It only mentions the Lord who was crucified. So that would be, allegedly speaking of Jesus, we would assume, correct? All right. And in that version, he claims to be a sinful man, right? Absolutely. Joseph Smith does in his testimony talk about how he was involved in a lot of sinful practices. So if a Mormon wants to say, well, Joseph Smith was righteous, they need to go back and read Joseph Smith's own account. Well, this is why I think that this first vision was a later invention. According to James B. Allen from Brigham Young University, apparently not until 1843 when the New York Spectator printed a reporter's account of an interview with Joseph Smith did a non-Mormon source publish any reference to the story of the first vision. As far as Mormon literature is concerned, there was apparently no reference to Joseph Smith's first vision in any published material in the 1830s. From all this, it would appear that the general church membership did not receive information about the first vision until the 1840s, and that the story certainly did not hold the prominent place in Mormon thought that it does today. They didn't know about it because it wasn't being told. This is a later invention by Joseph Smith. Now, let's switch to the Book of Mormon. We have Jeffrey R. Holland. To consider that everything of saving significance in the church stands or falls on the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon and by implication, the prophet Joseph Smith's account of how it came forth is as sobering as it is true. It is a sudden death proposition. Either the Book of Mormon is what the prophet Joseph said it is, or this church and its founder are false a deception from the first instance onward. So you see, Mormon leaders understand the importance of these two stories in their history. And I have found that if you can convince a Mormon that these two stories are not true, they're probably on their way out of the Mormon church because it all hangs on this testimony. Mormonism stands or falls on the testimony of Joseph Smith. Well, let's go on and let's look at this a little more closely. First of all, we know that Joseph Smith claimed he was visited by Moroni on September 21st, 1823. It was Moroni who said that there was a book deposited written upon gold plates. That's significant because you're hearing Mormons now saying, well, they weren't gold. They were golden. Why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? They're trying to change the, the metal content. Why? Because they know gold is heavy and they know that becomes problematic. Well, I often respond by saying, well, gee, gold also looks like gold, so what's the issue here? But I, I want to bring out the, pe the fact that, look, don't you believe it was Moroni that buried the plates? Don't you think he would have known what they were made of? He says gold plates. Joseph Smith said, well, they had the appearance of gold. So what? The angel said they were gold plates. Let's go by the firsthand account here. Also, giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent and the source from whence they sprang. All right. Smith is allowed to retrieve the plates on September 22nd, 1827. So this would be four years later. He wraps them in a linen frock. He started through the woods thinking it might be safer than the traveled road. So much for his 
prophetic insight on this one. But just as he jumped over a log, he was struck from behind with a gun. Okay, actually, he's a man with a gun. The gun doesn't operate on its own. <laughs> Joseph, however, was able to knock the assailant down and flee. Half a mile later, he was assaulted again, but managed to escape. And before he arrived home, he was accosted a third time. His mother said that when he reached home, he was altogether speechless from fright and the fatigue of running. Interesting, this story is in a correlated manual, manual Church History in the Fullness of Times. Joseph Smith's mother in this account says that the, that the plates were located about three miles from the Smith home. So Joseph Smith is carrying these plates for a distance of three miles. He's able to jump over at least one log with them, and then he's accosted three times. Why three people wanting to steal the plates from Joseph? And this is what Mormons believe that they were trying to do. Why would they steal? Why would they spread out like that? I mean, you know, a wolf pack mentality would have worked a lot better. Why didn't all three hide behind the log with the guy with the gun? I don't know, but they decide to spread out for some strange reason. And Joseph Smith, with these plates, was able to knock them down in such a way that he was able to run at the top of his speed, his mother says in her account, with a limp that he had ever since he had leg surgery as a boy quite a feat. See, Mormons have never really tried to duplicate this story. They read it, they believe it, they don't really see through the problem areas that many of us have, have found in uh, our reading these accounts. Now, Joseph Smith claims in the history of the church, volume four, page 537, these records were engraven on plates which had the appearance of gold. Each plate was six inches wide, eight inches long, and not quite so thick as common tin. The volume was something near six inches in thickness, a part of which was sealed. And you can see here this little metal brace bracket here. This is all that Joseph Smith translated was the top two inches, according to the Mormon church's story. All right. Well, let's think about this. If the plates were really that size, according to Joseph Smith's own writing, then gold weighing 1,204 pounds per cubic foot, the size Joseph Smith gives us, means that the plates that he had were one-sixth of a cubic foot. Nobody really disagrees with that, all right? If made of gold, Smith's plates would have weighed around 200 pounds. Now, there's my replica set of plates being picked up by a Mormon apologist. And it was interesting when he picked up my plates, the first words out of his mouth were... Well, you know, some people think the plates only weighed 50 pounds. And I, to which I said, you're a Heartland model theorist. There was no 53 pound plates in North America. He's using an argument for Tumbaga, which is only found in Central America. I don't know if you realize that when he used it, but what, why was that comment so significant to me? He knew the plates were too heavy. And my plates, being sheet metal, are only 80 pounds. And I try to tell people, if you want to get up to the 200-pound weight that Joseph Smith probably had if the plates were really gold, you have to take my 80-pound plates here, double the stack, and add another half a stack. By the time I explain that to most Mormons, they see there's a problem here. So then we start getting all the, the real strange excuses. Joseph Smith was a buff farm boy. I've heard that until I'm blue in the face. And, uh, but the big one is the miracles. Don't you believe in miracles? And this is my response to that. And this is one that you could use as well. If Joseph Smith was really given a miracle by God to lift 200 pound plates, why are Mormon apologists trying to get the weight of the plates down to a manageable level? Why are you taking away glory from God? You mean God couldn't allow him to pick up 200 pounds as 53 pounds, as some are trying to argue today, that argument doesn't work. No Mormon apologist, as I uh, bring out, no Mormon apologist argues that Smith was given supernatural strength. Instead, as I say, they try hard to get the weight of the plates down to a manageable level. And you may even hear one guy out there, he, he, he's been telling people that I'm telling a bunch of lies that the plates only weighed about 30 pounds. You cannot get these plates down to 30 pounds. I don't care if Joseph Smith had aluminum plates, okay? You cannot get the weight down to that small level. Well, that's what Joseph Smith's father allegedly said. So what? We also know that Joseph Smith's father, by the testimony of one of his own sons, never saw the plates. 
So how does he know what weighed 30 pounds, if he said that at all, okay, if that was really a legitimate quotation? So there's a lot of problems in this, but I've heard all sorts of excuses. Now, what does the Book of Mormon supposedly contain? The Book of Mormon is a sacred record of some of the people who lived in the American continents between 2000 BC and AD 400. It contains the fullness of the gospel. Joseph Fielding Smith, the 10th president of the church, said by fullness of the gospel is meant all the ordinances and principles that pertain to the exaltation in the celestial kingdom. That's quite a statement he's making there. It makes you wonder, has he ever read this book to come up with a comment like that? But yet this is what we hear. I, I was out there Thursday night listening to a young man who's very faithful Latter-day Saint telling me about the superiority of the Book of Mormon. But yet when I was asking, what does it teach? Oh, it teaches everything you need to know. What? What? I can't get answers. I can't get answers. I'm, trying, I'm dealing with a Mormon missionary in email right now. He also wrote me because he believes in the superiority of the Book of Mormon. What does it teach that I need to know to get nearer to God? As Joseph Smith said, he will not tell me. The best thing he's told me so far that he thinks is a good answer is it mentions Jesus Christ more times than the Bible. That's an answer? I mean, come on. That might work with some ignorant investigator, but you know, I may have been born at night, but it wasn't last night. So that's not going to really work. You got to do better than that. And we need to challenge our Mormon acquaintances on this and start to get them thinking about these issues. Smith said that the, uh, he told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth. And the keystone of our religion, a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts and by any other book. But yet when we start looking at what the Book of Mormon doesn't teach, you'll notice the unique teachings of Mormonism are not even found in there. And they're not even found there. I don't have time to go through all these. In fact, it's being a little stubborn here. It doesn't mention men can become gods or any of those things. Let me, let me go through these and just give them a quick glimpse. All right, eternal progression, word of wisdom or any type of health code. It doesn't mention anything like that. And I'm having a hard time with my little, there we go. And then we have these. Doesn't mention Aaronic or Melchizedek priesthood, temple endowment ceremonies, celestial marriages, baptism for the dead, mandatory tithe. And yet we all know in studying Mormonism that these points are absolutely necessary for Mormon hopes to achieve exaltation. And they're not even mentioned in the Book of Mormon. All right. So, exaltation. Correct. So to date, we have no evidence that Nephites existed. Okay. Nephites exist. No evidence of Nephite, that's, that's bad English. Sorry, I went to public schools, give me a break. Uh, um, no Book of Mormon city has been verified. No Book of Mormon artifact has been found. The LDS church takes no official position as to where the alleged Book of Mormon lands were located. Mormon tours to the alleged Book of Mormon lands, they're, they are admittedly speculative. Even the one put out by, at that time, it was the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies, now known as the Neil Maxwell Institute, when they would have tours to the Book of Mormon lands, they would always say things like thought to be, could be, may be, never anything that was definitive. So these are problem areas that we can raise with our Mormon friends to get them to start seeing some problems in this book. But I would hope that you would not stop here. See, I, I want to go on and show why I think not only is the Book of Mormon inferior, Mormon history is inferior, but I want to show them the superiority of the New Testament gospel. And I want to use this to hopefully gain their, their confidence that I know what I'm talking about now. Let's switch gears and let's start talking about where they are in light of eternity. So that's, that's my hope if um, when I get into a conversation with a Mormon and I didn't get the bell rung. All right, so I'm done. All right, so Chip, I give it back to you. <laughs>